start with the four ways. Yes, three little crosses up on the northwest corner. Four way heads. Oh. Is it the truth? True. Is it the fair to all concerned? Well, the good will of well, the fair to all Great. Thank you, everyone. And we welcome some guests today. Um, first of all, Chip Weiner. All right. Yay! Yes, he's a, a, a definite maybe, so we have to fill out all the documents and everything. A so definite maybe? What kind of a thing is that? Well, this is the gauntlet. You know, he's had to make his mind up whether or not he wants to run the gauntlet. So. Okay, so you've been talking to him <coughs> about doing what? Pardon me? You've been talking Oh, to we've him. been talking about that uh, we need somebody to come in and be the Grand Master of uh, Bike Throw. Yeah. Some of us are getting old and we are overcommitted. And so Chip is thinking strongly about coming in and running that for us. And so I'm really excited myself. Well. That's great. But wherever we end up, it's back where we started, right? You started this uh, 20 about, years ago. about 20 years ago. Right? Yeah. Really it up. So. Okay. And uh, also, as a guest, we have Christina, right? And uh, this is your second meeting in a row? It, it is. I'm a Libertarian down in Southern California. Very and I've been here for the last two years. Okay, thank you for being here. Thank you. This is the smallest crowd we've had in a long time. I, I was asking Brian, he said there were like 18 there's quite a few people. Both tables were full last night. Yeah. Must be the snow. Yeah, must be. Okay, um, let's see what we have here. I, I want to do a little bit of business, um, but uh, let's start with uh, happy dollars. Anybody happy about anything that you want to make a country? I'm happy the boys have a home game on this Saturday. You can't come. Um, no, sorry. Saturday at 3.30, we have the first round of uh, the state playoffs. If they win Saturday, they go to Pendleton. If they lose, they're out. So they only take since COVID eight teams to Pendleton now. So that's it. And they won against Bandon big time. They, they should have won against Oakland. Yeah. So they had two games. They what what game, order did they go? They had a game on... Friday against Bandon. That way they won that one. And then they had to play the team that won on Friday. And so they played Oakland on Friday. Oakland's three miles from the neutral site. Oh. So Oakland had their band, their cheerleaders, and their refs. Oh. And all. Uh, it was a very interesting game. We started the game with a technical because our bookkeeper wrote one of the kids' numbers twice because oh. he was in a hurry. And we ended the game with a technical, they say Corby got, but actually Reg Williams got it. Reg Williams yelled at the refs, they thought it came from Corby, our coach. Oh. They gave our kids a technical, oh. and we lost by three points. Well, that seems like we got homered. Oh, we did, yeah. Anyway, they're, yeah, they have one more home game. Okay. Saturday. Saturday. Hey, Jerry. I'm just happy to be alive. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. Anybody else happy though? Well, I got a lot of money, so uh, I'm just going to do, uh, this is going to be my, uh, for today, I'm going to take the next two meetings here and pay for it. And I'm just, I'm just happy, yes. I think. Um, I've also got an announcement on this. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of business before our guest speaker. Um, I'm happy because I uh, just had a nice vacation with my brother to Arizona to watch Oregon State baseball. They won three out of four in the tournament. Nice. And it's kind of fun just to see a different culture, you know. So down to Arizona, we're staying in Scottsdale at a pretty plush resort. You know, we, you know, it's just kind of interesting seeing the people and what they, and, and, and what's weird about the Phoenix area, I think, is everything's laid out on the grid. Just think we've got planning here. Just everything is just so, because there's no, everything's flat, right? Uh -huh. and, and it's just kind of amazing. Usually there's not a merge on the highways. The highways just, you, you know, getting the right two lanes to go somewhere else. There's almost no on or off ramps. They do things quite a bit different. <laughs> but anyway, so that was a good trip. Happy about that. And to see another another world. We went to a church on Sunday and it was, I 
guess. I mean, it looked like a like $100 million church. I'd never seen anything, you know, marble this, marble that, and artwork beyond what you would ever Lots see. Lots of retiree money down, down there. Down in Scottsdale, okay. that's right. Okay, any, any other happy dogs? Sure. No water, but lots of marble. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to live in the most beautiful place on the planet. It's beautiful here. here it's very here. lucky to live here this one in Chicago. Yeah, thank you. We'll get this. This goes to the, what, our general fund, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. And this will go to Becky, so we'll make sure that happens. Thank you, everyone. Those are happy dollars. Let's do trivia. What we do, what I like to do, is do for fun just a little bit of trivia. And if you get a question right, everybody here is eligible. There are two chocolates. <laughs> and so this is important stuff. Okay, let's try the trivia. Not sure I'm going to pay attention. Um, so the first category is stars of business. Of what? Stars of business is what it's called. This brand of Italian sparkling water has a red star on its label as well as a red star on its blue cap. Can Pellegrino? Yes. Oh. See, I said that with a question mark. What is Pellegrino? Oh, good job. And let's try one more. For many um, of those uh, that are Christians, today is a big day. What is today? Good. Nice job, Christine. Very good. Are you the answer? Huh? No, no, no. no. What was what? the answer? Ash Wednesday. Oh, it's Ash Wednesday. I don't see any ashes on your forehead, though. It would have been a giveaway. Yeah. It all got washed off in that snow when it came over the pass. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good point. <laughs> okay. So we've got trivia. Let's talk a little bit about beauty business. Now, I called Brian the other day, and we talked a bit about some different things. And Brian thinks that we need to have a business meeting, that there are some important things to cover. Um, how would every, and then I was thinking we would just have it as part of the meeting. How does everyone feel? I think about we need to have a separate business meeting to just sit down and hash things out. Okay. okay. Please. Okay. And so when when do we do that? Are when we do you mean by separate? Okay. Separate from the regular meeting? Mary? Yes. Okay. So I'll be, I'll be happy to attend with anybody else who may. I'll find time. You want well, I think the first question, question is, is this a midday meeting or an evening meeting? Yeah, what, what is convenient for those who are... So Jerry, you're on the board, right? Yes. As long as it's not on a Monday, I can I prefer midday. Midday, okay. No, I don't want to do midday, which means it can't be a Wednesday because we have Rotary. So right. we're talking about maybe a midday meeting on Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday. Or unless, unless we met earlier or on a meeting day. Mm -hmm. I would do an 8 o'clock meeting on Monday. I just couldn't do it after mine. I'm big on, on early morning meetings myself. You like early morning? Does that work for you? How, does that work or not work? Yeah, I'm, I'm free. <laughs> Can we meet at the library that early? Mm -hmm. Yes, assuming. So do you have a preferred, like, are we talking in the next? As soon as we can. As soon as we can. So. Um, I'm gone next week. You're gone next week? Okay. Um, well, I think it would be good if Jeremy were there. Um, so, the week of the 6th? Okay. Um, we could do... Yeah, we, we, we could do Monday morning or... Is the 6th of Monday? Let's do Monday morning the 6th because we have a high on health meeting at 4 that day. So it would be great if we made any decisions or mm -hmm. anything. Okay, okay. Great. I'm great for it. So you want to do 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock in the morning? Uh, is this like an hour, do we think? Yeah. 
Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so we've got uh, March 6, 8 a.m., and the venue is, were we talking about the library or coffee shop or what? Library. 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 Um, in the conference room on the second floor. Okay. Uh, the building's locked, so I will meet you. Okay. Thank okay. You. And Jeremy, can you get the word out to the officers, yep. including those who aren't here today? Okay. Thank you. Um, let's. I also bring up a couple of other things about business. I think that there were going to be some hands to go up, but um, so this is. Uh, this has been talked about, but uh, our sister club in Port Orford will be having their craft date, right? And that's on the 25th. So you go after the ball game, right? No. And it's <laughs> at uh, 6 p.m., $40 per person. And go on the Saturday, because they had two posters. One say go on Friday, February 25th, and then it said Saturday. But probably Saturday would be the better one to go to, right? Yes. Okay, so, um, and it's going to be at the Port Orford Community Building for anybody that's interested. 40 bucks, they serve crab, coleslaw, beans, bread, and dessert. And uh, money goes to women's scholarships. Okay, then um, I think our guest last week was Ashley McGee, and she sent out an email that I forwarded to some of you. She's with South Coast Together and a pathway to positive parenting. She indicated she wanted to participate in, like she said that your children's activity, I, I assume that that's the body in the park. And, uh, I will send out the same package I sent out to everybody else. Okay, so let's take a time out on that. Has a date been set for this year for a party? Of the yes, month? it's the 15th. And the reason it's, it's the 15th rather than the uh, a week before that is, is that Jessica, stole the pavilion for her wedding. Oh. So we had to go the following week. That's naughty. Okay, so right. can you... Uh, <coughs> the 15th of what? 15th of July. <coughs> and I sent, uh, basically, to everybody that participated in the past, I sent out a... Uh, so we're having a... The first Thursday in March, we're having the first kickoff. And I don't have anything in my calendar. But you, you'll get back with her before we do the email, can yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I already have it, so I, I am in the process of sending it out. Okay. And then, uh, I think that we have other things that... Brian, did you want to announce something separately? Uh, there is a lot of stuff we need to talk about. Why don't I give you everything I want to make this meeting? Yeah, we'll put together an so, agenda. So let's do it offline rather than trying to figure out what it is here. I think that's great. And, and if anyone else has any topics, just email me. And if you're new here, it's just mgherbage at gmail.com if there's anything you want to bring up or talk about or whatever. Um, yeah. So, uh, Mary. Um, we have been assigned an exchange student. She is a female. She is Inez Bienini from France. And oui. she, huh? We, oui. we, oui, oui, oui. 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 And so I have to go to the high school after I get through here and talk to uh, the counselor about what they need from the high school for her. And then we need to make some decisions. So we'll talk for about her that as well. yes. at, the, at our business meeting as yeah. well. Okay, good. Okay. That's pretty cool. So, I think most of you know that we have an exchange student going to, going to <coughs> Taiwan, Formosa, and and then so one is coming back um, from the train. Pretty cool. Um, okay. Any other visits? Yes. Yes. Uh, there is a uh, volunteer recruitment event that's going to occur April fifteenth between 11 and 4 p.m. has been organized by uh, a lady with the friends of the library. And I got some posters here, but uh, everybody who has moved into this town in the last year is being sent a postcard to let them know that all these different people 
So we've got people like Christian Health, um, Curry Search and Rescue, uh, Hospital of Yoli, so whole, there's about 20 nonprofits will be there to demonstrate who and what they are to hopefully attract some of the new entrants into the county. How did you get a list of all the new people? We paid for it. It's sure. $75 for the county. We'll so wait. everybody that basically bought or is renting a home. Perfect. So moving right along. Right. And we're going to use that list for other things too. Yep. But, uh, so you got Saturday, April 15th. That's right. From 11 to 4 p.m. That's a long time. Wow. Okay. Well, there's 20 different groups so we want to give the new people a chance to get to know each one of these nonprofits and see where they want to spend their time. Because in my experience with people when they move here, one of the first things that they ask is, I would like to do something. Who's doing what? So is the Curry Health Foundation on your list? Is what? Curry Health Foundation? Yes, they are. Oh, good. I wonder why I haven't heard anything. Right there, Curry Health Foundation. Okay. April 15, 11 to 4, what do we call that? It's a volunteer recruitment event. Okay. Okay. Um, and part of this is because um, COVID kind of killed a lot of the uh, volunteerism in the county for yeah. whatever reason. People got out of the habit, whatever. I think this is kind of a restart, so it's for new people and also restarting some of the existing people. There will be prizes, I think door prizes of some sort. So, uh, people come in and sign in and uh, there will be prizes. So. Okay. I think there's going to be goodies too of some sort. Uh, cookies and coffee and whatever. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Brian. Anything else? Jerry, yeah, Jerry. Is anybody here, has anybody here signed up to go to the April 7th shindig that Colbish Main Street is having? Is that the wine day? Yes. Okay, so I was hearing I'm from I did. Mary about that. So Marna just sent me an email and said that she wanted me to announce that the tickets are all sold out. Great. And if you would like to pick up the tickets you've reserved and pay for them there at the Bank. Bank with Becky. Great. Okay. Very nice. How, what would they limit that to? How many people? Uh, 50. Uh, 50? Yeah, so much okay, sounds great. So, anything else? No, for us, okay. for me. Thank you. Um, we do have our guest speaker. Becky Crockett, she tells me she is related to Davy Crockett. And so I think that's one of the most important things to get out of today. Um, Becky works for the county. Um, she handles the planning matters and supposed to do other things. And we really appreciate her being here. There's a lot of issues, a lot of things having to do with housing and all kinds of different things. Um, We've always had a lot of respect for planners. It's an interesting group because to be a planner, there's no certification like per se, like to be a lawyer or a doctor, but what is expected of them is uh, extremely difficult and detailed. And, uh, so thank you very much for being with us. It's my pleasure. And I was able to get here through the snow. There wasn't much snow to get here from Brookings. Um, I'm not sure what this group wants to hear in regards to land use planning. Um, as Jerry mentioned, it's kind of like some days in the planning department, you feel like you get questions about, you know, where to go to get your haircut and then, you know, how to develop your land in the meantime. Um, we in the planning and building department get over a hundred phone calls, emails, people walking in per day, wow. per day. And I know that is usually a shock. It's a, definitely a shock to people that have been in Curry County for a long period of time, but it's not so much a shock to people that are moving here and have a lot of questions about properties that they are interested in purchasing. And we enjoy helping the public because if we're not answering those questions that people have when they're getting ready to buy a piece of property, we're usually on the other end and, and having to tell them, no, you can't build a house on that property that you just purchased. And we don't like to be in that position. So we readily uh, embrace our realtor community 
and we work a lot with them to encourage them to have their clients contact us and to, for them to contact us and we've trained them on, on our GIS system, or our website to make sure that the land use information is out there with a lot of these people that are moving into Curry County. We have not slowed down in Curry County as far as the interest from outside entities, primarily California, for the past, well, since I walked in the door in early 2019, it just, we have just continued to accelerate the amount of questions and the amount of applications that come through, which is a really good thing if you're interested in Curry County growing, because certainly over the last four years, there's been a tremendous amount of growth, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen that. Um, in response to a lot of that growth, uh, we've done some code changes just recently in September of 2022. We did do a major update of our zoning code really to address some issues that were becoming a problem. And the one problem that's out there that a lot of people have run into is this issue of short-term rentals. It seems like uh, there's an enormous pressure from outside the area. People come into this community, they buy homes, and immediately they turn them over to short-term rentals and then they go back to Scottsdale, Arizona or San Diego and they, you know, have these short-term rentals managed by a local property manager. And some of those are good and some of them, well, are a little shaky. So then you get a lot of complaints about the short-term rental that's the down the block or the community block that is turned into really a vacation block and there aren't consistent people there, which uh, gets people that live there full time pretty alarmed. So we put in place short-term rental requirements in Curry County and the Board of Commissioners passed an ordinance to deal with that in just this past September of 2022. And we gave people that currently have short-term rentals essentially six months to come through and get a permit and get a land use permit to have a short-term rental and they have to be compliant with certain provisions of our code. Um, and after that, we have quite a, a, a ramped up enforcement group and they will be out um, April 1st to take on these people that have not gone through the permitting process. A lot of people have asked us why we're asking that these people get a land use permit for a short-term rental. Across the nation, a lot of people use a license process. Um, what happened in the state of Oregon is a lot of areas that were concerned about short-term rentals, they went to the voters. And, and Lincoln County is one of them where they essentially said no more short-term rentals. And that's in litigation right now, and it might be for a while. But the bottom line is, um, if you put in place a vote of the people and you have a moratorium on short-term rentals, um, the only way you get around that is if you have a land use permit. A land use permit is not subject to being revoked through a vote of the people. A land use permit is a permanent situation, and especially the way we dealt with that in the code is we said that that permit for your short-term rental is good in perpetuity. So that was kind of the, the, you know, the carrot to get people to come in and get that short-term rental permit. Yeah. Isn't there, don't you have something in place where if that um, rental does not meet the minimum characteristics in it or qualifications that it will be excluded? I mean, what, I, what you don't want is somebody to come in and get grandfather of this place and turn it into a dump. Uh, close to where I'm in Seca Beach, there is some short-term rentals that are just garbage. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, you actually you brought up multiple issues in what you just said. Okay, so the first issue is we have a requirement that the structure that the short-term rental is in has to be a legal structure. And, you know, just that requirement, it, it shocked us. 75% of the applications that have come in so far, and we probably have close to 70, 75 applications, 75% um, of them have illegal structures on the property. And most of the structures are what they're renting as a short-term rental. Oh, wow. Yeah, it has shocked us. We figured maybe a third of them would have illegal construction on the properties, but no, it's easily 75%. 
So, and, and because the issue of short-term rentals, the business part, is so lucrative, those people are anxious to get through the building process, the building permitting process, so they are legal because we will not legalize them unless everything is legal on the property. And we do require the building inspector to go out on every one of them and they do a fire life safety review. Otherwise, the county would assume liability if something happened in the structure. At Nasika Beach, we do have two applications and there's a lot of construction that, are, that is required in order for those to get up to par and being mean, able to rent out. The one home we rented, of course, we had to come in doing landscaping for us and the uh, breaker box was rusted shut. Uh, there, half the outlets in the home were not functional. Only one burner in the stove was functional. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I guess my worry is, um, I have no problem with this. I think as long as we limit the number, so that we don't have just everybody trying to do this, but we limit the number in the county, because we're now caught between a rock and a hard place. We can't build, we can't get a revolt boundary change because the state says we have enough houses. Well, we don't have enough We houses. don't have enough houses. So, no. uh, you know, this is a very complicated problem. And I guess yeah. I'm kind of interested in the mechanism that you see using here to, first of all, qualify somebody, reject them if they don't continue to meet the qualifications, and how do you arbitrate when you have more people wanting a home than is available? First come, first serve, or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's just too many issues to cover in this show. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I mean, this is, I'm, no. I'm speaking as a homeowner, as somebody that's yeah. in this community, where we have a severe housing problem. We, we do, we do. And on the issue of the short-term rental, uh, the, the provisions in the code that were adopted, in my view, are very restrictive. And I wrote them, but essentially I reviewed every short-term rental ordinance in the state of Oregon from both cities and counties that have them. And I did pull out, for the most part, the most restrictive provisions because that's what the board wanted. And that's what the people wanted when we were going through the process of asking, well, what should this look like? People wanted to have strict requirements for being able to have a short-term rental. And what we've already seen over the last four months is a lot of people are frustrated because they're making money in these structures that aren't up to code. And they want to continue doing that. And we're saying, no, you will not continue. You will go through the process, get proper permits, and comply with the requirements of the code. So we see people angry at the counter. We also see them saying, I'm not going to do short-term rentals anymore. I'm going to go seek a good long-term renter. And, you know, or I'm just going to continue until you shut me down. And we do expect we'll probably have, you know, anywhere ballpark of 100 to 150 people out there trying to continue to rent short-term rentals without permits and that's why you know internally we're having a series of meetings on with code enforcement on how do you want to enforce that and you know as soon as we get our strategy together we'll sit down with the commissioners and ask them point blank do you want us to enforce this provision where we shut people down because it wouldn't surprise me if we don't be in a situation where you're shutting down 100 plus sh private short-term rental operations that are out there because they don't want to get permits, or they can't. They can't. But, but if they were growing marijuana illegally, wouldn't the county shut them down? <laughs> <laughs> That's another really good question. It it's really comes down to the DA on marijuana. Well, but I mean, I, I guess I'm just saying, why would we not enforce one code versus another? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the intent, the intent is to be fairly enforceful on the issue of short-term rentals. That's what the people are asking for. When we get the phone calls, you know, nine out of ten are you, you need to get a handle on this. The, the 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 board has directed us, directed me to come back and talk to them. You know, at the end of March, that'll be, that'll be the six month period of time where people were supposed to come in and get their permit. And at that point in time, the board will consider, you know, some kind of ceiling. Uh, it's like a cap 
uh, do we stop at you know the 75 applications we have, or do we allow 200? Um, we'll have that discussion at the end of March when we see what we're what we're getting. Um, when we started, when the board adopted the provisions, we didn't get hardly any applications. We're getting a lot of applications now. Every week, it's you know five to seven applications per week that people are coming in. Now, one of the things that's kind of prohibitive for people is the cost. It costs $2,000 to get a short-term rental permit um, and you have to go through a review process every two years and at that review process we go back and look see if the conditions are the same, did you comply with the, all of the criteria and if not you lose your, your permit. Uh, it's as simple as that. Is there a cost after two years for you to come back? Yes, and then it's a five hundred dollars every two every two years after that. So it's two thousand to start, yes. and then five hundred every two years. Yes, that's a lot. You know, I worked for Lincoln County for over six years, and you had mentioned that at Lincoln County, you know, they have it's different than here because they have hundreds, if not close to thousands, of short-term rentals. But one thing that people maybe don't understand is that cities have police power, so you're not regulating probably within Gold Beach, for instance. It's, no. It's unincorporated areas, right? Yes. And uh, in Lincoln County, too, I wanted to mention, we sometimes call those short-term dwellings or STDs, but <laughs> I, I just wanted to throw that out. I still have a question. I just yeah. When you were talking about that, I wanted to ask. So I have no issue with it as a realtor. I think it's great for homes. What I just came upon yesterday was jobs condos were built to be short-term rentals. Do each uh, one of those homeowners there have to apply for this? Yes. Why? Yes, and we've talked to them, we've talked to the people that are managing jobs, and uh, they actually don't want a blanket approval for all of the people that buy within that resort system. They advocated for individuals to get the get it, permit. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the, the worrisome part is what do we do with Wales Head? Yeah, and that's a conundrum. Well, because that's a lot of little places. Yeah, and you can't have a short term rental in an RV. A park model is an RV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that's out there. Um, we, we have not had any applications so far from Wales Head. We have alerted the management at Wales Head about what we were doing before it was adopted and then after it was adopted we did give them notification that this requirement was in place um, haven't heard from them so you know we'll see i expect that when they start coming forward there will be a discussion with the county commissioners on how they want to deal with it i mean we also said you guys probably if you've lived here any length of time you know there's a lot of shortcomings with that development Mm -hmm. Overall, I mean, the roads, I mean, getting in and out if you have a fire is, uh, is frightening. Uh, water, sewer, the whole thing, it, uh, like I said, it's a development with a lot of shortcomings. Well, what about Turtle Rock? Same thing? Same thing. Oh, wow. But they're in the city limits. Uh, yeah, they are. Okay. Right. So yeah. They don't They've got other bigger issues. <laughs> Because I'm on a couple of boards and you know, housing is such a terrible issue here. I'm on the hospital board. I'm <coughs> I can tell you four vacant rentals that nobody's calling on right now, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, I'm just, I'm just looking at the fact that yeah. I'm looking at all the offers we made and people have turned them down because they couldn't find a place to live. You know, it's like 80% of the offers. That was a year ago. That's not current, though. Okay. Do you, do you have a separate category here of accessory dwelling units handled in a different way? Yes. Yeah, and one of the handouts, uh, I had a handout on the short-term rental and I also had a handout on accessory dwelling units. Okay, so it used to be accessory dwelling units were allowed inside the urban growth boundary. That wasn't a problem. Um, and then there was uh, three different legislative sessions where the legislators just uh, adamantly opposed to agreeing to um, accessory dwelling units outside the urban growth boundary that was finally approved at the last legislative session. So 
but it required a change in local land use codes to allow it. The county has adopted provisions to allow now an ADU outside the urban growth boundary. It's very restrictive though. You cannot have a short-term rental in an accessory dwelling unit outside the urban growth boundary. Neither the primary house nor the accessory dwelling unit can be used as a short-term rental. And that was, you know, in response to the housing shortage throughout the state of Oregon. If you have an ADU inside the urban growth boundary, you can rent that out as a short-term rental. So that's what the conditional use permit. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and so, and then on your, uh, you've been talking about uh, short-term rentals. In Lincoln County, those were not handled as land use because they didn't want that to become tied into all the regulations that are associated with land use. But you, in, in this county, have tied it in. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And after looking at the litigation, primarily in Lincoln County, yes. as well as Clackamas County, yes. um, and you know, now there are other people that are in that litigation situation, uh, I just felt that it was more of a guarantee for the people that really were making that a good business to put it into the land use arena. And plus it does give us better enforcement capability if it's a land use decision and they have to meet certain criteria. As soon as they're out of compliance, they're subject to code enforcement. Okay, and do you generally, the decisions are made at the ministerial level with you and then they could be appealed to the planning commission? Is As, that absolutely, okay. yeah. Yeah, they're, they, we give notification and Everybody in the surrounding community of a short-term rental gets notification. Uh, we've got lots of comments in the record. Um, I've been a bit surprised so far. We've approved probably upwards of 25. Uh, nobody has appealed to the planning commission. Wow. Even though we have had property owners, you know, make some pretty disparaging statements about some of these short-term rentals that we have approved. They have not appealed them, and part of the reason I think they haven't appealed them is we give them the criteria and we tell them three strikes and that short-term rental loses its land use permit. So they have the ability to monitor that short-term rental next door and call us if there are non-compliant issues. If they're partying past 10 o'clock, that's a compliance issue, you can't do that. So uh, maybe maybe people are thinking, you know, three strikes and I'll get that, that short-term rental out of here. I, I don't know. So the next thing I did want to talk about a little bit is um, enforcement. Okay, so Curry County has, uh, the commissioners were big over the last two and three years on the issue of enforcement. And rightly so. Okay, so in planning, we get a lot of people that come up here and they buy a home uh, or they build a home. And what we found is essentially every day we find an illegal house out there. An illegal house. A house that was built without permits, without anything. There's a lot of them. It had, that has been an issue that has been shocking to me. Just like, you know, all the illegal... Um, construction associated with short-term rentals. Um, for whatever reason, over the last probably 20, 30 years, and Jerry, you probably know this better than I, because I wasn't here, I was in Portland, but there seemed to be a carte blanche appreciation that you could build without permits in Curry County. If you talk to the contractors, they will say, oh yeah, you don't really need permits for this or for that. Um, we get that kind of feedback a lot. Mm -hmm. And well, so, people shared power meters, they shared water meters, they did all kinds of things, so it never ever raised up to a level where it was seen. Yeah. And you go out these places, you find where it's going every which way in some of these places. Well, the county commissioners felt that it was time to get serious about these provisions. Uh, the first thing they did uh, in 2020 is they put in place what they called an amnesty program. That is, if you come in and you go through the permitting process, you don't have to pay double fees. We'll get you right through. We'll make your situation legal. Quite frankly, not very many people took advantage of that. And so then it becomes enforcement time. Commissioners have allocated three positions to enforcement 
in Curry County, which is a, a lot. Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, I came and saw you a while ago because I was told I didn't have a, a final bill, a final occupancy permit. Yeah. I got one way back when, yeah. and somehow it disappeared. So I had to get another one. So the county hasn't been totally clean on things either, but some of that stuff, don't know what happened. You know, inspections were done, people came out and got paperwork, and there's no absolutely on target on that one yeah and, uh, oh no it's frustrating yeah uh, we do it every day you know we have that discussion and usually i err on the side of the applicant that is you know most people are pretty on well half the people are honest half of them probably aren't but you know we we try to if there's any documentation any notation in the file it doesn't matter to me what it is it could be written on a napkin if it's written and it verifies that something was approved or you know what happened in your favor um, my position is well, that's that's credible that's definitely credible because there is a loss of records. And when I started to work there in 2019, I was in a state of shock. I had never seen such a disaster. And not that I fixed anything, but at least, you know, we're a little bit more careful with the records. I was selling a house in Mesica Beach and the as-built permit for their septic system mm -hmm was located on a property at least four miles away. And because I knew the properties, I called and, and Penny helped me. I mean, she moved it to the correct. But I was like, so I don't understand. I'm selling a half an acre that has a pond on it and hills all around it. So those there there were misfiles. Yeah. And you I yeah, you have well, a lot so. to deal with. Yeah. Some of the problem was we had I know I had inspections from people who were not county inspectors. People come down from Coos County or came down from Roseburg to do the inspections and it went into the ether. Nothing, I mean, I got a document with my hand from them, but it never ever appeared in any of your records. Yeah, yeah. Well, none of, none of that surprises me. In fact, yeah, it's true. It's true. There's a lot of chaotic record keeping, if any, at all. I like this because it says that you're going to go back and dot all the I's and cross all the P's. I think it's great. We do the best we can, let's just put it that way. It's still, like I said, we get a hundred, a hundred things coming at us every day. And our objective, you know, one of the things that happened when I got there is uh, people didn't regularly return phone calls or emails, I mean, and so people stopped calling. Why call if you know you're not gonna get a call back? Um, so, you know, our mantra is we return a phone call every day. If not that same day, it would be the day after and try to answer the person's question. If we can't, we tell them we, have, we can't answer your question. We're going to have to do research. You know, that's kind of our, our mode of operation. And that's why we get all of the input. It's because we try to be responsive. Um, so I do want to talk about housing. Is that okay? We switch. Yeah, a couple minutes there. Where are we? Okay. Thank you. So the issue of housing, that's, this is a really hard one, and I really appreciate your comment that there are rentals that might be available because uh, I'm meeting with the hospital, with uh, mm -hmm. Jenny mm -hmm. and the superintendent from the school district, the cities. Um, we have kind of a tight group right now in trying to figure out how to deal with housing. We had a housing committee, had three or four of them, and they were disasters. Um, because as soon as you start talking about housing, we get the, you know, the homeless advocacy and they want to just talk about that. And when we say, well, the priority is probably workforce housing, because if you don't have the right people here, you can't serve the homeless population. Um, so there just seemed to be a lot of conflict. So now we have a very tight group. And, and we've worked through a lot of issues. Uh, the bottom line is there is no federal money available for Curry County to build houses. And in order to get federal money, you have to really be servicing the low income folks, the Section 8 folks. That's what the money is there for. And that's been really frustrating because we have real current day experience in seeing what it costs to build a house for somebody that's a, you know, a, a, a police sergeant or a nurse at the hospital. And it's just really hard to build housing for that person, the workforce. It's essentially the workforce. 
So we've moved into this element of how do we build housing for workforce, knowing that we're probably not going to get any federal help. And we have three examples right now that we're trying to work through and learn from and figure out how to go forward. The first one is, you guys are probably familiar with the Rogue Hills example. I guess it, Rogue Reef is the name of the new subdivision. Um, you know, I followed that all the way through the process from the time the applicants came in to get that approved. And that project was, the intent was that there be workforce housing in that development. Well, a house at Road Reef right now, I think they're running at $625,000. Clearly, that's not a workforce housing situation. So, you know, that's what happens in Curry County. You build something, your intent is really good, but the bottom line is those builders, and they had some other issues too, but they could not afford to, you know, build a house here for $300,000, and they tried to at the beginning. So another example we have is a city, in the city of Brookings, we had three, three business people that came together, they're long-time business people here in Curry County, and they said, we're going to invest and build this uh, multifamily development in the city of Brookings. They brought in their engineers, and the bottom line is they had the money, but they costed it out, and they would have to take in quite a hit on it in order to build it. So they pulled out. And then just the last couple of weeks, I've been working with a, a group out of, that's trying to do some housing in Port Orford. They're from the East Coast. And there's, they came and said, I can't pencil this out. There's no way I can build in Curry County at a price where people can afford to pay for the, what I build. It's like you can't build a $300,000 house in Curry County. And when you say that, it just sounds ludicrous. But that's the reality. That's where we're sitting. The only possibility that we're looking at right now is the governor that has allocated $130 million, and she set up a, a group in Terminal 2 in Portland, and you know I went there to see what they were building. They built these prototypes, and they're actually not so bad, using this, uh, it's not strand board, it's a, a kind of a reprocessed timber board, and they're trying to see if after they do, do these prototypes, they want to send them around the state. They have five of them. We're trying to get one here in Curry County. If that is something that will withstand the elements and be something you can live in for, you know, long term, you know, the objective is Senator Merkley and the governor has said, I'll allocate money to build a whole bunch of these. And so we're trying to track that and see if we can get a prototype and see if, if the prototype works. Can we get, you know, subsidies essentially to build this, uh, that kind of uh, dwelling here in, in Curry County. But well, it's no, I, was, I just attended a meeting oh, I guess six months ago now where they had used these large 3D printers to print homes. I think you're probably familiar with that over here. Yeah, yeah. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, so they, they actually go out and they print the house. Uh, and they can put a house together in like a week. There's uh, another group that's over here on uh, Warm Spring, Springs Indian Reservation. They built a bunch of houses. But and those all, you know, the land was basically free in both cases, essentially. Yeah. And so it's just materials. And I think we have a problem here with labor is we, unreasonable. Labor, the cost of materials. Yeah. You know, the objective on, you know, this latest thing we're looking at is, it, you know, we think that, you know, we easily could put in place 300 homes because that's the demand from South Coast. That's going to be the demand on the north part, you know, Port Orford. Um, and so the objective is to see if the Walsh company, because they're good construction people, and they actually did a lot of the construction for abandoned dunes housing. So the hope is that if this thing works, maybe get them to come down and do construction right here in Curry County or in Cruz County, someplace that is more located. Because, yeah, you can't bring materials from any place else. It's just too expensive. So that's kind of where we're at with housing. It's it's a, a frustrating process. I know Jenny at the hospital. Well, you know, I, I 
we have problems here, but I think it requires, I think you're doing a wonderful job. I mean, your department, before you got there, and I'm not pointing to anybody, but you know, right. I, it's like when I got the house, it was just one nightmare. No, I went in at that time, there was, I think Susan Snow was her name. Yeah. Because I have, I have split zoning on my house, and her on my lot. And so I went and said, I'm not going to have a problem building it. She said, oh, no, I'm not for it. I said, would you sign this saying that, please? So she signed it. And then when I went to build the house, oh, no, you can't build on that. That's worth the raising, and this is uh, R10, or what's R10. Right. And so I had to do this big variance thing to build on the house. And so I think the thing that bothered me so much was there were a lot of people in the county that didn't know what they were doing. Certainly didn't know what they were saying, you know, about, about zoning and all the rest of the stuff. And I mean, I think the biggest problem is that you could really help us give consistency, to sure people know what they're talking about, and enforce it. I mean, we've had such a history of not enforcing in this county, of uh, people knowing people, and because they knew people, this didn't happen to that didn't happen. So that's the real thing you can do in this county, is getting some rules and regulations. Well, I think a lot of it is the commissioner's support. The commissioners are very supportive. I was retired when I took this job, mm -hmm. and you know I keep saying I really don't want to do this job. We tried to hire another planning director; that didn't work at all. We're um, glad you're here. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> but, but I said the focus then has to be on training from within and training mm -hmm. a person that is going to stay here, that's really planning to be in the community for a long period of time. And that's what we're trying to do. And the commissioners have been so supportive of that. Uh, you know, they let me hire two people. I have two temporary people and two full-time people. And the objective is to get them trained up. They're here. They're in the community. They're not going to go to Lincoln City next year. Next year, after they're trained, and that's that's the only way to do it. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Sure. How many ADUs have you had in the last two years inside the urban? Yeah, not as many as I would expect. Um, probably 20. That would be a good But some people, for some people, it's a lifesaver. I mean, literally, their child has moved back, is a professional person, and doesn't want to live at home. That's what we have. Yeah, and so the ADU option is just absolutely perfect. So we do that. Thank you so much, Becky. <laughs>